Hello and welcome to Miss Charlotte Astrology. I'm Miss Charlotte, a full-time working astrologer, and on this channel I analyze the astrological charts of public figures, and very often they are celebrities. But today I'm doing something a little bit different. I'll be reading the chart of someone who is better known for being infamous, not famous. Uh, I'm looking at the chart of Mary K. Letourneau. She was a, a primary school teacher in the United States who, let's put it bluntly, she fiddled with a child. She's a kitty fiddler. She's a kitty fiddler. She fiddled with this child. She got pregnant with, uh, she got pregnant with two daughters. So she had bore him two daughters. Uh, she went to prison for a while. And then when she got out, they eventually got married in like 2005 when he was a legal adult. And they stayed together right up until her death. I do think he filed for separation in like 2019, 2018. But because she was because she was uh, diagnosed with a terminal illness, he went to her bedside and held her hand until the very end. So he was a very loyal husband. Um, there's a very fascinating interview. I think it was in 2018 they did this interview with Australia's Channel 7. And it's very telling telling go watch it i did last night it goes through over an hour fascinating she is was an absolute looney tune you know when aquarius and aquarius has a god complex and they can't justify their evil behavior go watch that that's a fantastic example she just waffles on and on with this bloody word salad trying to justify her fiddling with a kid and she denies being a kitty fiddler i i go watch it it's wild um so i thought you know what? i really want to look at this woman's chart and here we are this is a pretty accurate one too because i got a birth time so this is it and i want to read it before i dive into this uh chart reading i just want you guys to know that i'm having a retreat in egypt in march from march 7th to march 13th it's a bit of a road trip from cairo to luxor and we're going to see so many things uh, the Grand Egyptian, is it called the Grand Egyptian Museum? The big one in Cairo. Of course, we're going to see the pyramids and we're going to see the Sphinx and we're going to see, um, we're going to see the Valley of the Kings and we're going to see, uh, oh my gosh, there's so much more. There's so many things we're going to see. The markets, I'm so excited. I'm going to buy so much perfume when I go. If you would like to join me, and by the way, this chart reading is involved. I'll, I'll put the link below. Sign-ups have to be done by january 17th so if you're interested in hanging out with me for a week in egypt uh just below just click the link thank you i look forward to meeting you <laughs> all right let's dive in um she's a hell lot of aquarius i want to talk about her fourth house before i start talking about her aquarius placements i just want to talk about this so fourth house uh the ic two degrees in Scorpio, it marks out the home. This is where you rest your head. This is the domestic space. And she has a very difficult placement. She has Neptune here. And looking back at the, looking back at the interview with Channel 7, I remember thinking, why isn't she talking about her parents? She didn't, she just waffled on and on about Christianity or Catholicism and religion and or something. She didn't actually answer any hard questions about her mother and her father, not a single word really. And I'm wondering if that that was true, like she grew up quite re like in a religious environment. Neptune governs Pisces in the 12th house, belief. It's also nightmares and lack of boundaries, so we'll get there. But Neptune in the 4th house could indicate a very religious household, but it could also indicate a household that is traumatized by drugs, abuse, there's no boundaries here. Like her fourth house, she cannot stand on solid ground in her fourth house. This is the foundations of her chart and it is a rocky foundation. Not even rocky. It's a watery one. Look, it's Scorpio water, Neptune water. She can barely float. She's like she's drowning in this fourth house. And look at this Neptune and all the painful red lines that lead to it. What did this household what kind of what kind of trauma did this did this uh, i'm trying to think of the word unstable household what kind of scars did it leave on her so let's look at 
these red lines that shoot up into pretty much almost all of her personal placements. Well, yeah. She has her sun, Venus, Jupiter, and Mercury all in Aquarius. Is it Mercury? I think that's Mercury in Aquarius. Yeah, it would be. She is highly intelligent. I mean, she can she can intellectualize her bad behavior. She can make it okay with herself. Um, the sun is the ego when it lies in Aquarius. That is a bit an, of an oddball. That is an odd person. Uh, I love Aquarians and um, not her, but Aquarians. I, people ask me, what are Aquarians like? And I'm like, I don't know because they're all so different. You can't put them even in the same box together. Aquarians... Aquarians have it difficult because it's literally the sign of the alien. You know, they are they are very strange people and they're oddities. The Venus in a conjunction with the sun points to a very charming person, especially in the seventh house. So even though she is an Aquarius, an oddball, because it's playing out in the seventh house of peaceful partnership, she knows how to bend and twist herself into different forms, into different shapes in order to um fit in to society she can play it very sweet she knows how to act kind uh her having a sun and venus in the seventh house points to her also like a libra being quite needy and quite codependent uh even though aquarius is a pretty independent sign uh having that this house placement uh colors that a little bit she's an oddball but she's a codependent oddball venus in aquarius tends to be Someone that doesn't really have a type or someone that loves to have an alternative relationship. You know what I mean? Like they tend to be like, I just want to have a throuple. I want to, I want to like live in a nudist colony. Like, <laughs> like Venus and Aquarius, they're kind of weird in love as well. Um, and a, Venus and a, Venus is the value systems and the love language. If it's in the sign of the alien world, they could speak many different languages. They don't really have a type. Um... But with Venus in the seventh house, it's hard for her to understand or perceive her own value or beauty or self-worth unless she's in some kind of romantic partnership or platon even platonic partnership. Like she's very needy of, of a partner. Now, I think with Jupiter in a conjunction with all of this can make her incredibly generous. It can make her incredibly kind, but it can also magnify her god complex anything jupiter touches is going to expand it's going to expand on good things yes like her being potentially a very generous uh polite kind person at least in a superficial sense but it can also expand the worst qualities of aquarius and you know the dark side of leo Think about how narcissistic, when Leos are badly behaved, when Leos are vain and narcissistic, they have this God complex. And the dark side of an Aquarius is Leo. So they can, <laughs> and I love my Aquarius friends. This is not hate on you. This is when we're in your darkness, when we're when you're being a bunch of bitches, okay? Uh, you can, you can really... You can really, really be arrogant. You can, you, even when you behave badly, you feel justified in your bad behavior. And this Aquarius certainly felt that way. Go watch that interview. It's really interesting. Uh, her south node. Her south node is in line with all of these lovely placements, including her Mercury. So people with a lot of personal placements on their south node, especially their sun, they get a lot of praise and honor and glory very early on in life like very often unless there's squares and things there's other things that affect it but generally when a south node is on the sun think kate middleton right very early on in their life they're praised for their uniqueness or their high achievements or their beauty or you know like because the sun is unique expression it's creativity ego so if the south node of the early part of your life previous life you're probably going to get a lot of applause a lot of praise but when the North Node is far away from all of those things, there has to be an ego sacrifice. Now for her, because it's moving away from her seventh house to her first house, she has to say goodbye to a lot of friendships. She has to say goodbye to a lot of relationships because she has a Taurus midheaven and Venus is here as well. She has, she's going to be disgraced. The working relationships, her ability to, to, to get a job, at least in the same industry. No, no, not when you're a kitty fiddler. Not when you justify being a kitty fiddler, nah. Um, 
it's really interesting that she has a Mercury retrograde in a in Aquarius, and it's not too far away from Chiron. At first, I thought this was a Mercury uh, Mercury Chiron conjunction because it looks like they're close together. They're not really in a conjunction, but they're not far away. I can see that with the Mercury retrograde, she, as intelligent as she is, it's almost like she's stunted. I think intellectually, she's like she's very smart, but she has. She's not the best communicator, especially with other adults. Go watch that interview I talked about. Someone who's highly intelligent, but she's a terrible communicator. Um, and also retrograde. Retrograde is, it's restricted. Retrograde has trouble progressing. Not to say if you've got a Mercury retrograde, it doesn't mean that you're dumb. Okay. First of all, it doesn't mean that. It just means there might be trouble with communication or there might be there might be some level of intellectual difficulty, but it doesn't mean that you're dumb, okay? But in her case, in this woman's case, she's kind of slow. Like, get it together. Like, when you're watching this interview, you're just... Are you dumb? Like, when you're watching... Her Mercury in Aquarius retrograde is very obvious in that interview. Uh, she has her Chiron in the 8th house, so that is a wound uh, of marriage. That is a wound of shared... Uh, uh, of shared resources marriage can be an incredibly painful thing um it does trine that neptune at the bottom there this doesn't necessarily mean this is a pleasant placement sometimes water trines can also be painful just because something is easy doesn't mean that it's not painful like chiron isn't a chiron is not necessarily it's not a personal planet it's not showing any kind of personal progress um what's this what is this is telling me that the wounds that she suffered in the household, this lack of boundaries, potentially abuse, potentially, um, I mean, there could be criminals in her family. I don't know, but this is there's a reason why she didn't talk about her family in that interview. It's because follow the blue line. It led to an insecurity around material possessions, around partnership, around intimacy. Yeah, marriage is is a very difficult thing for her. Um. It's just, it's very interesting. Uh, I want to talk about her Midheaven and Taurus. So if you look at her picture, it's very sweet. Look how angelic she looks. She looks like such a Taurus, right? Because the, the highest point in the chart, the Taurus Midheaven, um, that is what the world perceived her as. Um, to the world, she was, you know, it, Taurus is institutional. Taurus is very wholesome. Taurus is, um, it's a, it's a very lovely, stable energy. And she has Vesta up here. She has Ceres up here. These are very wholesome asteroids. But look at all the red lines. Look at the disgrace. And remember, uh, squares is war. Squares are, indicate like a conflict between two parts of yourself. So the Midheaven at two degrees in in Taurus, that is her wholesome image of the primary school teacher that, you know, teaches the ABCs and the one, two, threes, you know, follows all the rules. Nothing, you know, there's nothing here that is revolutionary. Think Kate Middleton again, like that's someone that, that she really lives up to her image and she obeys the authority. But not this one. Her Venus, which rules the midheaven, Venus is love, Venus is relationships. Her Venus, her midheaven ruler does not get along with the midheaven the relationships this tells me inappropriate relationships her heart will get her in trouble venus square the midheaven uh there's also there's also the sun like her big ego and her arrogance her her being herself her you know being her odd little alien aquarius god complex self is gonna get her in trouble too her arrogance the audacity is gonna get her in trouble and she also has saturn squared oh that's that sucks she's got two planets that are governing that 10th house like venus governs taurus so that's the ruler of the 10th and then saturn uh saturn also um because saturn's associated with the 10th house that's another placement of disgrace because it's squaring off with that midheaven so the two rulers of the 10th house do not get along with her 10th house. Like it's, she has so much karma around relationships, like having Saturn on the descendant. That's someone who is very desirous of a long connection. Someone who wants to have 
marriage, but it's also someone who likely might get divorced. I'm not saying it's going to happen 100% of the time, okay? I'm open to being wrong, but notoriously, Saturn in the 7th, Saturn in the 8th, karma around relationships, karma around marriage, karma around shared resources. That's divorce placement a little bit. I have seen people with this placement that haven't gotten divorced, so everybody calm down. Uh, but that is there. Um, old woman. And you know what's really funny? She really, because she's a she's an Aquarius stellium, a Venus in Aquarius especially, she values an intellectual connection. But she had that with a child. Isn't it funny that someone prioritizes an intellectual connection is connecting with a child? Ew. Ugh. Ugh. Kitty fiddlers make me so sick. Um, And it's because I was a teacher for a while and I felt like I knew I knew a few of them in my profession. Not that I ever had any hard evidence, but I got vibes as a teacher. Anyway, she makes me sick. Um, so yeah, uh, who she is, all these personal placements, they disgrace her midheaven. Even her moon doesn't get along with her midheaven. There's no personal placement here that does well with her midheaven. She just is destroying her image all the time. Her moon is in Sagittarius. So there's no... There's no solar placements here. She has a Mars in Capricorn. We'll get there. Okay, so the moon is the home. It actually rules this fourth house. That's not far away. Uh, but the moon in Sagittarius is someone who's always wanting to run away. The moon is home. The moon is the mother. The moon is your emotional processing. If it lies in the sign of Sagittarius, that's someone who's always desirous of a new adventure. They want to run away. They want to go on a magic carpet ride. They want a Disney movie. They can be very delusional sometimes. They can be incredibly wise. They can being very intelligent but they're all very often unless they have like some grounding placements or emotionally intelligent placements they will want to run away i want to live overseas they might be <laughs> i just want to get out of my small hometown because the moon is where you find home but it's in the sign of the foreigner this is an indiana jones placement it can be very delusional Unless they literally want to live, or they actually can do the practical thing and, you know, set themselves up and actually travel and live overseas. Like it can be done, but very often they don't. And then they're constantly dissatisfied with life. Moon, uh, Sagittarius moons are always so hungry, starving. They cannot just settle. They, they have a trouble planting their feet on the fucking ground. They have so much trouble with that. And they're always running away. It's so annoying. Uh, but I love them because I understand you. I'm criticizing right now. I understand. Please don't be hurt. But you need to learn how to ground yourself because as a Sagittarius moon, if you're listening, one day you're going to be old and you're not going to have a house to live in and all the people that you ran away from are not going to be there for you. You need to forge relationships that are for life. You need to invest in something. You can't just keep running away from your family and from your friends and your problems. Eventually you have to deal with them. Take care of yourself. Take care of others. Stop running. <laughs> Plant your feet somewhere. Um, but her, and her moon is playing out in that fifth house of leisure, pleasure. Uh, that's a bit of a risk taker. So uh, generally when someone has moon in the fifth house, they really love dance. I think she even, did she talk about that? I think she even talked about performance art and how she really enjoyed it. I think she might've mentioned dance. Go watch it. Uh, but moon in the fifth house, they really they put their emotions and their maternal energy into fifth house things. I mean, it could be a bit of a risk taker thing, risk taker placement because it's leisure and pleasure. It, it, it could be quite sexual. It's dating, but it's also about artistic expression. So she might be quite artistic with this placement. Um, but it's, yeah, she's got a lot of squares. Chiron square the moon as well. She's got Pluto square the moon. Pluto and Lilith squaring the moon. What happened to her mother? Her mother looks like she's in pain. Something happened to this woman when she was a child. Her mother, something with her mother. She could have had a tyrannical mother. She could have had a very hurt mother. And maybe both of those things are true. But there's something going on. There's a reason why um, she's she's never happy. She's always ch she's chasing rainbows, like that song. She's always chasing rainbows. Is that a Judy Garland song? um yeah not an easy it's not an easy placement it's a creative placement but it's not an easy placement she's a runner 
Um, her Mars in Capricorn, Mars in the sixth house. I mean, that is well aspected to her Taurus Vesta and series in the 10th house of work. I feel like she was a hard worker. She was a good teacher. Um, and with Mars in the sixth house, they're prone to accidents. Also health things. I'm just letting you know, if you've got a malefic in your sixth house, take care of your health. It doesn't necessarily, I'm not promising you that you're going to get sick. Please do not project your issues onto this reading of this woman. She's specific, but she's it's a very specific case. But Mars in the sixth house, they just need to make sure that they're careful with their health that's all just um just you guys trip over a lot of things i will say uh, but uh yeah mars mars is war mars is sex um mars in capricorn is exalted it's a fantastic placement to achieve your dreams um but and it is really really well aspected at midheaven so i feel like she was a very successful teacher it's one of the few placements that she has that is very well aspected it's very hard working um but it is in a it's it's in an out of sign conjunction with Saturn. So and Saturn rules Capricorn. Saturn is karma, Mars is sex, then there's a lot of karma around sex. She I always tell people that have a Saturn Mars conjunction, you need to be careful where you throw that. You need to be very careful where you're throwing that thing. Your pee pee. Just don't throw it around like, woo, lassie, woo. You can't just throw that thing. You have to be careful. It might boomerang and come back and hit you in the face. It might like it, may, it might make something explode. Oh my god, that's a really bad analogy. But anyway, you get what I mean. Like you pay for sex. S being irres sexually irresponsible is going to bring terrible karma to you with this conjunction. Um, yeah. It also is also squared the midheaven too, so sex is going to get her in trouble. But it is very well aspected to the Vesta, so it's a bit of both. Mar her Mars and Capricorn is both good and bad for her tenth house. Um, with the North Node of Destiny in Leo, that is when someone has a North Node in the first first house. That's you taking you come you're coming away from the seventh house of other people and codependency and relationships. You're letting I'm not saying you have to let go of everyone. Okay, this is a toxic woman here, so. Please don't think that you're going to end all your relationships and that's your destiny if you have this placement, okay? North Node in the first house is about taking up your sword and your shield and your helmet and fighting it out and defending yourself and you're the main character. That's what a North Node in the first house is. And Leo is about being the star. It's a super, for this, it's a super narcissistic North Node in, in her specific case. Not yours. Just because you have the same placement, it's not the same thing, okay? Take I'm taking into account all her other aspects. But she... And it's at the, get this, it's at the 18th degree, which is the sick and dying degree. If you have an 18th degree, please don't get upset with me. It doesn't mean it's going to happen. I'm talking about her. But the 18th degree is sick and dying. She will fight into the until the death. And she did. She defended her actions until the day she died. And the North Node does lie very, very close to Uranus, which actually governs all of her Aquarius placements in that seventh house. So she's defending who she is. She's defending her actions, even if it means that in the end, everyone hates her. And because it's, it is squaring off with all that Taurus 10th uh, house stuff. She's disgracing herself until the day she dies. Someone that has this placement, not that they're similar people at all, um, but I think it was James Dean that had a North Node in a conjunction. It was in a conjunction with Uranus on the Ascendant. He died because he was being selfish and reckless. I'm not saying if you have this, that's your case, okay? I'm not saying that. You have to look at aspects and things like that. I'm just trying to think of someone that has a similar placement. And she has, it's a similar placement. His was in Aries, uh, hers is in Leo. But it's just something that I that I noticed. Um, but yeah, when you have your North Node in the first house and there's Leo and that's you learning how to fight and defend yourself. I mean, for her, it was for the wrong reasons. She she lost so many friends. I think she was quite alienated to the awards at the end of her life. When you watch that interview on channels, Australia's Channel 7, note how insane she is. She literally, she lost her marbles. She lost her marbles. Pluto in the second house with Lilith. Money looks bad. It is pretty well aspected to the midheaven, but at the same time, toxic relationship with money. Hmm. Um... I'm just looking at this vest. I'm looking at um, Juno in the ninth house. 
marriage to a foreign lover, foreign partner. Vili is Samoan. Vili Samoan. It's just interesting. It's just that, and it's it's and it's sextiled with Jupiter. So the husband and wife placement is actually good. I mean, I know Vili is an abused. He was an abused and groomed child for sure, but he was a fantastic husband. He was. A, it doesn't justify any of it, by the way. It doesn't justify any of this mess. But he was a good man. He he grew into a good man. It's a shame what happened to him. Um. But yeah, uh, ninth house is travel and it's foreign. And uh, when someone has like a placement, like a Venus or a, or a Jupiter or a or a Juno like this in their ninth house of the foreigner, foreign lands, they might end up with a partner that has that's from a completely different race, background, religious upbringing, language, all that. Might, might be from someone from far away. And Vili was those things. I know he was American, but he was Samoan ethnicity, which and she's white. So that um that that makes sense to me. This Jupiter sextile um. Uh, do you know sextile Jupiter because they're the husband and wife they seem to get along um but yeah that's it guys I hope you enjoyed that that is Mary Kay Letourneau let me know if you would like me to do a sinistry chart um I've made it so if you want it I can do that for you um so we can understand their relationship a little bit more put it in the comments and um I do 60 minute readings so if you would like to book me i've linked those below i also if you can't make an appointment i do recorded readings and they're sent to your email so um i really uh, i really appreciate you supporting my channel and my little business thank you so much bye